Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you uh, very much for coming today. I think the, the conversations so far have been really enlightening and what we're hoping to add to it is sort of how we as OMA approach facade design at like a very conceptual level. Uh, what we're going to present today are three different projects. Each of us was very intimately involved in the design process and, and development of these projects. And so we can give you kind of an insight into how our initial concepts developed into very specific uh, facade designs in very different directions. Uh, something you're probably aware of with OMA's work is that our buildings often look quite different from one another. And this is something uh, intentional uh, because we really hold the, the concept at, as the core of the project and, and you always use that to sort of inform the development. So as I said, we'll be doing three projects. Uh, we'll let sort of the surprise of each one come. I'll start with Galleria Guangyo, which is a, a department store project in a sort of suburb of Seoul. I think that we do a number of retail projects uh, at OMA, and the one thing we're always looking at is, is what is the demands of the clients uh, for these shopping environments? And the thing that everyone always expresses is how competitive the retail environment is, how important it is to create something seductive, how important it is to create kind of a, an exciting and shared experience, especially for a program which uh, quite often sort of coincides with public spaces and uh, public interactions. So this is the challenge, like how to create something that's really seductive and exciting for a program which is kind of ubiquitous and uh, at times banal. The, uh, let's see, is this one working? I have to use this one. Is it? No? Okay. Start pressing this one, but it doesn't work. Okay. Yeah, so this is sort of the, the statement I was uh, talking about. I think uh, the first place to look is the site. So what you can see uh, is a program in the site here. Uh, at the time of the, the development of the project, there wasn't really much at the site. It was all kind of under development. The, uh, the program was, was very straightforward, very typical uh, for department store, especially in Korea. It's about uh, 50,000 square meters of shopping which should be efficient, and which should be opaque, uh, which should be sort of uh, single level, kind of divided up. And then on top of that, uh, a number of amenity programs. The, the surrounding site it was uh, sort of a new town. So what you can see here is the, uh, all the residential towers, a sort of central CBD area, which will have more distinct buildings, uh, a lake kind of next to our site, and the, the big freeways bringing everyone in, in addition to trains and uh, other methods. As the site has grown, this is a recent site photo, I think from a couple weeks ago, you can sort of see the character of the city. Uh, the residential towers and office towers and hotels, they all kind of merge together into a forest of sort of uh, generic, kind of repetitive architectural scale. And uh, the impression given is kind of one of just uniformity, like as I said, in terms of scale, in terms of aesthetic, and in terms of the sort of landscape and relations between landscape and building. Uh, our site, however, offered kind of a different approach, just in the envelope. And what you can see is the, probably the, you know, the most banal shape you can imagine. It's kind of an awkward, boxy building envelope. Uh, but to us, it was kind of formally interesting because it's a counterpoint to everything else happening around this forest of repetitive towers. So we kind of leaned into this shape because uh, it really worked for two reasons. One is, first, you don't need to sort of fight the necessity of the department store to be a sort of boxy shape. Uh, you can really work with the ideal department store layout. And second is, any deviation that you make from such a basic, uh, strong shape becomes quite strong in its own right. And so you're able to draw really interesting contrasts. And that's what we did here with this, with this concept that you see. 
we have an efficient retail box that's kind of carved away with this ribbon of uh, sort of experimental retail space. So here we were able to take sort of a minimum intervention into the retail experience, but sort of maximize its impact. Uh, views to the outside, its impression on the overall building, and the sort of diversity of spaces that were able to be created for this kind of more public loop or public way of, of moving through a department store. So the result then, uh, when you combine these two things, is basically to make them as, as contrasting as possible. Uh, we basically embrace this idea of a formal purity and strength, and that we kind of maximally abstract the facade into something almost uh, alien, and then carve it up with a very dynamic glass, uh, transparent sort of yeah, ribbon loop of, of spaces along the edge. So in the context, then, it becomes an architectural object that's totally surreal. It avoids any kind of uh, sense of architectural scale, and it becomes sort of fantastical uh, as a seductive object uh, to attract visitors and to create sort of an excitement of, uh, of a shared experience at an urban scale. And so this is sort of the main goal of, of the approach to the facade design, is, is really how to maximize the the simplicity of, of this facade, the contrasting of these two elements, and maximize then the sort of sense of fantasy, the sense of surrealism, uh, and the sense of excitement. So I'll start with the stone. And uh, here you see a, a side photo of our stone facade in the background. What we really wanted to do was something that seems probably quite funny, but something that was really intentional. Uh, we really wanted to take to create something that was primordial and monumental, and basically to work at a scale not of architecture, but of sort of geology, of nature. And so to achieve this surreal effect, we basically looked at the qualities of actual stones and looked at them at a scale that was almost kind of absurd in an intentional way. Um, you know, what, what sort of impact can nature, like a scale of nature, a scale of like a cliffside have in an urban context such as this? So we looked at different uh, colors and gradients, veins. We used different samples. These are all travertine. Our, our initial hope was uh, for a travertine facade, unfortunately. Unfortunately, but probably for the best, uh, it wasn't a good idea to put 80 meters tall of travertine. Uh, a bit expensive and, and a bit unnecessary, ultimately, when you see the result. So we, we looked at all these different stones and took the qualities that we liked and, and brought them into sort of a composite image. So here you see sort of an unfolding of the entire facade uh, and one stone image that wraps the whole thing. And so we made this in Photoshop out of a few different pieces and uh, really tried to capture some of the qualities we were looking for, which is a gradient uh, from dark to light and uh, sort of these horizontal bands that run through the whole building and then moments that are sort of eye-catching and, and distinct at various scales. And so this captured all these qualities. And, and the reason they were important is because the, the dark stone to the light stone is something that adds continuity to the whole facade. And the bands also give a, a sense of continuity. So you have sort of a vertical continuity and a horizontal continuity, uh, which is important because when we took this and ap applied it to the facade, uh, this is an actual sort of elevation, unfolded elevation of our building. You can see it's interrupted by a number of, of exceptions, but that the overall image remains strong and is legible. So the reason we were able to, to uh, or how we were able to do this is, was just kind of a simple grasshopper script uh, that I wrote that basically maps, takes uh, a number of specific colors uh, from the image, 14 categories of colors, and then applies it to a diagrid uh, on the facade. So we're able to sort of create a, a pixelized version of this stone image uh, just with these 14, 14 stones. And so here you can see a comparison between the, the base image on, on the left and the, uh, yeah, the sort of pixelated diagrid version on the right with the different colors. And so, yeah, these are the 14 categories of colors uh, from dark to light that form the whole entire facade. And these types then were just mapped to our elevation. So here you see the, our drawing set uh, submitted with all of the different types yeah, mapped to the facade like this. 
And uh, so the effect is something really interesting because, uh, you know, at, at different scales, you know, at the scale of the entire building, you can see the, um, you can see the stone image. But as you get closer in, uh, the image starts to dissolve and break down into these very abstract uh, compositional sort of arrangements of triangles. And at a human scale, it's, it can be quite exciting. Uh, another way we wanted to enrich the facade and the reading of the horizontal banding, also to keep this sort of flat, uh, opaque facade kind of interesting, was the introduction of sort of reflective elements in the facade. And so we, yeah, as I said, highlighted the horizontal bands and give the building a bit more life. So depending on the weather or the time or your position, the building will look quite different um, in those different environments. Here you can see we, where we map, how we map the, uh, which stones get the special treatment. So uh, in this way, we take advantage of the fact that a department store needs an opaque facade. We take advantage of the fact that a department store requires sort of a very boxy shape. And we use that to sort of inform the concept in a maximized way to create sort of the ultimate extraction, extract, uh, abstraction of an object and drop that into the city. So this is a site photo from a couple weeks ago as the facade is coming in. Uh, you can already see the difference that it creates kind of peeking between the, the buildings there. As we move around, yeah, you can see how starkly it will contrast the rest, how alien it seems uh, with its lack of any sort of human or architectural scale. Uh, sort of the surreal quality and fantastical quality we we're going for is, is coming together. Uh, what's interesting, I think, also is that the sharpness of the form of the corners is, is kind of reinforced uh, by, the, by the pattern of the stones. Here you can see a, a closer view of the, of the front facade. Uh, the building is, this is, this is from a few months ago, the building is gonna open in February of next year. So the speed at which you're able to create this is also something um, that's great. I think I was stunned to, to see how fast it progressed over the last year and, and really look forward to it opening. The way the stone panels are installed are kind of, they're, they're collected uh, into larger panels off-site and brought to, to the site with sort of these sawtooth edges and, and just uh, put up quite easily. And here's that, that image of the stone facade and sort of the, the scale at which it functions. You can see the crane down at the bottom of the, of the image along with some of the archways. Uh, this also gives a sense of the pixelization. So here the image starts to fall apart. You don't read the the natural scale of the elements anymore, and it becomes sort of a fascinating mosaic. You can here also see the, the re different reflective qualities and, and how the exceptions are cut in to the stone to emphasize a sort of singular mass. Again, the, the reflective stone facade. So now that we have this, uh, this kind of massive object, it needs to be carved by this public loop. Uh, and that's where we get into the relationship between the, the stone and the glass. So now I'll talk about the glass. Uh, the glass is really meant to be ex experienced at a different, in a different way, where the stone is really about this kind of urban scale and this uh, sort of relationship between the facades of the surrounding buildings and the surreal object. Inside is really meant to maximize the sort of continuous experience um, that we wanted to make continuous by avoiding kind of repetition of modules, repetition of, of uh, larger shapes. So you never kind of get a break in this continuous flow of, of glass and structure. Yeah, and again, we sort of try and avoid this typical architectural scale of things, or architectural expression, working with triangles again, working with uh, scales which are not typical of, of windows or openings. And the way we achieve this is through a completely kind of bespoke uh, design process. The, the, the three-dimensionality that we were looking for in the facade is uh, also something that contrasts the, the stone. It moves in, it moves out, it even completely moves out of the building at some points, and uh, it gives you lots of different avenues sort of to lean out over the edge of the building and look down, uh, look up, and in that way it, it adds to the excitement. So just to give a, a bit of insight into how this loop works, uh, this is the unfolded kind of plan of the loop over multiple floors. Uh, what you can see is just a, a series of different shaped, uh, different shaped 
retail spaces uh, that serve different functions. I'll, I'll show a couple here. For example, you know, one area becomes a mini amphitheater that looks out over the city. Uh, another part becomes almost like a cliffside uh, edge where it becomes very narrow and you interface with the, with the glass and can look out over the side. Um, so these different conditions then form a single continuous ribbon along the facade. And, uh, and to do this, we had to draw a bunch of triangles. And we, we did it sort of by hand. The, the wonderful thing we, we got from, from VSA in this process is uh, a script that allowed us to, in real time, test whether the parameters of the glass were working. So whether the glass was too big or the angles were too sharp. So what, we, what, I, what I did basically is just move around these points to form something that, that never repeated itself that uh, also uh, conformed with the limitations of, of what, what the glass can be. So every single triangle is different. Every single kind of point is considered uh, and, and manually put in in the computer. And uh, one of the intentions of, of that approach was using triangles at different scales. So what you can see here is, is sort of larger triangles and smaller triangles that come together to form a sort of richness in the facade that, again, never repeats itself, but that, that kind of works uh, at different scales, whether you're inside or outside of the building, or whether the space is a larger one or a smaller one that you're inside of. <coughs> Here's a view of the, of the other facade. Uh, the geometry is very complicated. So this, this shows you a sort of unfolded elevations of all of these uh, triangles. And you can get a hint at sort of the complexity. Um, none of the, yeah, as I said, none of the triangles share the uh, same angles. None of the joints between the triangles come together in the same way. Every single part is different. And so that's what allows this sort of feeling of, of continuity and flow by avoiding complete, any, any repetition at all. So uh, yeah, this is the this is the other facade. There's there's over I think 1,600 uh, unique glass panels and a thousand different joints uh, where they where multiple panels come together. So we had to sort of map all of this. Uh, this is from the drawing set. The list of every panel and, and its locations and its uh, dimensions, the vertices, all of these points. And it was very convenient for us because this is the point where we were able to sort of uh, hand it off, I guess. Well, that's a nice way of putting it. We, we didn't have as much agency as, as we would have liked in the later phases, but uh, the result is something that was absolutely incredible. Um, each, of these, each of these joints, then, is custom, uh, custom made. It, unique molds are made for each one, kind of 3D printed molds that allow the twisting sort of geometries of, of the met structural members to meet in a seamless way and reinforce sort of the, the original concept of a seamless uh, glass sort of triangular irregular facade. <clears throat> I'll show you some more pictures from the site. So this is from the, the visual mock-up. Uh, you can get a sense of sort of the different qualities that these connections have. Sometimes, you know, seven pieces of glass will come together in one. And from the outside, it, it maintains a sort of level of abstraction that uh, matches the stone. So what you can see here are, well, you see a number of temporary clips. Those are the metal ones. Uh, if you look at this scene, for example, you can, you can see what the final effect will be, uh, a simple black line between two pieces of glass with minimal clips. So the whole facade will come together in this way. And uh, what's been exciting is seeing how, in the larger moments, these uh, pieces come together and how the irregularity becomes, you know, what we hope, something fantastical, something surreal, uh, something sort of continuous for the entire loop. Uh, this is an image of the, the main triangle that forms the, the entry moment. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, you can see moments where multiple pieces of glass come together. Uh, quite exciting for us uh, to see. This was the uh, render at the concept phase. Uh, and pretty soon we'll be able to see the final design. Uh, hopefully that gives you sort of an overview of how our initial concept kind of informed the process, how we took it to the most extreme level possible uh, to maximize the contrast and to really create something special uh, for this retail environment in Korea. <laughs>